Welcome to uh, our latest edition of the Growing Faith podcast, video, vlog, cast, whatever this is, wherever platform you are watching and or listening to this, um, welcome. And so we're, uh, we're talking through um, 1 Thessalonians. We've been reading through 1 Thessalonians last week, this week, and sort of next week. We're finishing 1 Thessalonians and starting 2 Thessalonians next week. Yep. Um, and then we'll be finishing up with Second Thessalonians. But um, it's been enjoyable getting to read through it. Um, it's a book that I haven't spent as much time with as other books. Um, and so we just wanted to take a little bit of time to discuss um, something that stood out to me while going through uh, First Thessalonians 3. As it's working through, um, Paul's talking about his concern for Thessalonica Christians as they're going through suffering. Um, and so he goes, we were concerned about this, so we sent Timothy to you to kind of see how you were doing. And... Uh, what it says here is that, um, but now that Timothy, starting in 1 Thessalonians 3, 6, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you have always had good remembrance of us desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brothers, in, our affli- in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks we can render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly, that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. And so what he's seeing here is that as the the Thessalonian Christians have continued to remain steadfast through whatever suffering has come, it has actually been an has lifted their spirits and encouraged them through their sufferings and their infliction. Um, And what that led to me thinking about was how important it is to hear the stories of other Christians, uh, the way God has worked, especially in times of suffering, to grow their faith and to grow their ministry, and how that's important for us to encourage our own faith. Um, And was thinking of some examples of past and present um, that we can look to as and why it's important to have those stories in our life for encouraging us and just kind of maybe pointing out some thoughts of reasons why you should read and study these things, reasons why we should communicate more about what's going on within our own lives, um, as well as um, just continuing to encourage one another in the faith. Yeah. As you were talking about that, I was thinking about a question that came to me from the church in Ecuador. And... um, they were asking some advice, and it was a kind of a thorny issue of how to be obedient um, where they were at. And like America, they have problems with um, sexual ethics. Um, children are born, and fathers aren't always known, and, and marriage is kind of iffy. And, and so in baptism, and, and like trying to draw a line of who gets baptized and who doesn't, and, and looking through repentance. And so this question was coming up, and they were asking some thoughts about it, and sharing some scripture, Hebrews 13. And uh, the, the, the person in Ecuador kind of had a response that struck me a little bit. He's, and he took me and generalized me with the American church, the church in America, which makes complete sense from him. Uh, but, you know, talking about the strict holding to the scriptures, but yet he sees that we do it and he sees that there is fruit from it. And so it was an encouragement to him to maybe take a, a difficult stand um, in their culture. Mm-hmm. And he was encouraged because of where the American church was. Um, and of course we know that's not always the case but it struck me at that point like what we do in America matters and of course I've gone there and had questions about <laughs> you know American pastor that was shot from by his wife or hit by hitman from his wife and, and so it went the other way about the bad the bad aspects and, and so it you know just brings to my mind how what we do good or bad is rippling uh, to other churches in other countries. Uh, so just as we look to other nations and look at how they're faithful and we get encouraged by it, don't forget that happens vice versa, where we project that um, either obedience or disobedience, compromise or faithfulness. So that, that kind of hit me um, as just thinking through that in a conversation I had this past week. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
even more when I do see them, the church in Ecuador or in other countries when they're faithful, um, stepping up, being willing to even be arrested for uh, their faithfulness. It's like, wow, okay, it moves me and encourages me um, to be uh, courageous. Right. Um, you, you and I both you know, have had stories with believers in East Asia. Mm-hmm. You know, is there, I don't know if there's any one of them that kind of comes to your mind, but. Um, I, I just think through the, a lot of it is really the, the long suffering of the ministry there. Yeah. Um, and just thinking through like the his- historicity within that people group of how long there were people going to share the gospel there and they're not being the fruit that was seen. Um, in fact, one person wrote a book on that called Mission Impossible where he's talking about how basically like there's no chance of these people being reached was kind of the thought process there because it was, it just, there was no gripping, no hold taking place of the gospel. Um, but then you've seen through the, the faithfulness of people over the years that um, eventually there did begin to go, be fruit born and the church has grown and continued to grow um, and has even continued to grow now through the seasons of suffering. That as, as er- early years of the church is growing, it wasn't a big deal to the government, but as the church gets bigger, as it grows more and more, um, there's more government interference, but yet um, even the missionaries that were in the area being less able to be present, not as much. Um, And I don't even know if there's any in the area now. Um, But that the church continues to grow, continues to um, increase despite whatever trials are come. And I I think thinking particularly of um, one couple that when we were there, not not when you and I were there, the time I was there before that, that we got to, um, I got to be a part of baptizing um, the guy named Ben. And it was just this process of them being, um, they were kind of stains on the community. They were homeless. Um, They weren't. The, and which is not something you see in the cities and usually they try and take get the homeless people out of the city so it doesn't look bad but he um, he and his wife they became believers were growing in their faith um, and came across upon a man that was um, sh- trying to drown his son and basically uh, Ben went and tried to stop him um, and the reason he was drowning his son is because he didn't get the grades needed to get into college and so there was, he brought shame upon the family so the father was trying to get rid of the um, just kill the son because of that so that there wouldn't be that shame over the family. Um, ben intervened, stopped him, um, and then a few days later that guy hired some thugs to basically come beat him to a pulp, um, and he was um, nearly died from it, um, but then came back, moved back into the area, and actually the police in that area allowed him to share his faith with like 50 plus people um, and kind of protected him and allowed him to have that opportunity because they'd seen his steadfastness, his faithfulness. Um, and from that, numerous people came to faith, and, um, and I, I know they were forced to move a little bit li- later after that. A job opportunity finally came up, and I haven't heard anything from them. But just seeing the faithfulness through the fact that there's people that tried to have them killed that, um, in a place that they regularly would try and shut down any opportunities they have to share their faith, um, they were steadfast and eventually got the opportunity yeah. to share the gospel. And that was an awesome story. And you know what's great about that story also? It, it does remind me a bit of the believers in Thessalonica. You know, we, we know from Acts, I think, 17, 16 and 17, where Paul wasn't there long. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he was there able to teach, but quickly got, um, well, put, raced out of time, pushed out of, time, out of town. But, you know, even as he came to Thessalonica, he was already recovering from his his beatings that he had in Philippi. Um, so, you know, the guy talking to him is all bruised up, black guy, I don't know, whatever, they, right. you know, beating him with rods. Um, and so, sounds painful. Yeah, it sounds, <laughs> it, it should have a lingering effect on his body. Right. And, you know, and so this is the guy teaching them. And, and so the beat up, bruised dude is sharing the gospel. They embrace it, and, and then he had to get chased out. And so he's wondering, man, they just did get it. Will they... Will it be received? Mm-hmm. And that was kind of the anxiety that he had waiting on Timothy and to like checking up on him. But then, the, you know, the things that he says, man, they received it not just as words, but the word from God. Mm-hmm. And therefore, it took fruit and root. And so it, it hits me with, like the believers there that you talked about, um, you know, the time period from when you were a part of the baptism and then when you hear these stories, it seemed like it was within the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't yeah. long. 
And, and so there's always the question in, of like, is it legit? Are they converted? Um, and we also look at it through the lenses of Americans, where it's like, okay, you, you teach them, they gradually maybe get into it, and, mm-hmm. and obedience is slow in coming sometimes. Uh, but when you see them, it's like, man, they quickly obeyed because they saw it as the word from God. Right. And um, it just it, it lets us know that it doesn't have to always be as gradual and as gentle as we want it to be. Mm-hmm. Or I think it could be. Um, but it might be, hey, is this a word from God? Believe it. Do it. And trust God with what happens. Right. And this is an element of understanding that suffering is going to come in life. Yeah. Um, I think if it's somewhere in First Thessalonians 3, I believe, where Paul says, uh, I, we heard that suffering came to you like we said it would. Like we knew, we knew that this was going to be a thing that happened. Um, and so we were worried, though, about your steadfastness through it all. Um, and they continue to remain steadfast because they had gripped on to it being the true word, the transformational power of it, and that ultimately being part of what encouraged them and strengthened them. And so with that, that's, that's been a big part of my life is oftentimes if there's a season of dryness, the thing that has benefited me most is being around other believers and hearing how God is working in their lives, um, especially people that are going through the tough seasons of life, the tough times. Um, and so that's been something that has encouraged me both, um, like we said, presently and then also in the past. Um, there's been people I've enjoyed reading. Adoniram Judson mm-hmm. is a name that comes to mind of somebody I've spent a lot of time reading about. There's several books written about him. He's a missionary to Burma who um, spent most of his life, rest his life there, was a Baptist uh, missionary there, and ultimately was able to translate the Bible into the Burmese language, and thousands and thousands of people came to faith through that. But it wasn't until, it took like seven years till they saw their first convert, or 13 yeah. years till a church was established. Throughout his ministry, um, he lost two wives and like 10 children to death. Um, at one point, he went through great elements of despair and despondency. At one point, he actually went into the jungle and buried, dug his own grave and sat next to it, just waiting to die, basically. Um, but God sustained him through it all and ultimately used him to finally, over time, translate the language, uh, translate the Bible into that language. And Burmese believer, Christianity became a huge root faith in the um, Burmese now. I never say it right. Myan- Myanmar, 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 yeah. Myanmar. <laughs> Myanmar yeah. area, yeah. Um, and there's still it can all be traced back to the work of the Judsons and. Um, yeah, what's cool is that we got them right here in Nightdale now. The people group, um, and I never can say this right, Karen or yeah, um, yeah that group, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, that uh, now it's like full circle. You know, come come as refugees because of the Civil War, mm-hmm. uh, and now many of them settled even in the Nightdale area. Um, and they'll know, you know, I've asked them. Right. It's like, oh, yeah, we know the name Judson. <laughs> and, you know, of course, the seminary is named after him. And, right. Um, their, their Bible, which is expensive for some reason, um, mm-hmm. is that same translation mm-hmm. that Judson did. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's a great story. Is, so is that your top one, you think? Yeah, I mean, of missionary, that's the one I, I tend to come back to. Um, yeah. There's a few people I've... Uh, David Brainerd, somebody that I've enjoyed reading about. I've been meaning to read his diaries, which um, Edwards kept. Giant, and yeah. They're in my giant Edwards books I have that yeah. have really tiny print, and there's like 5,000 pages, and I've been meaning to go through that. You, you, would, you should enjoy David Brainerd. I mean, he's yeah. it's like life of depression. Right, <laughs> right. And his ministry to the yeah. Native Americans. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I think... <sighs> The Insanity of God book, mm, yeah. Nick Ripken, um, was, I, I think, outstanding uh, to encourage us and challenge us in faith, um, where, you know, they kind of, different areas from communist um, Romania and um, former Soviet Union to China to the Middle East, you know, interviewing different people and how they persevered in faith and, and their stories. I I found that one to be very moving and um, powerful in that it wasn't just one man. It was just like a theme throughout in, in each of these, and, and the stories were gripping. Um, I would I would highly recommend that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's come out in the last, what, seven years? Yeah, um, seven, ten years. And there's also a second one called Insanity of Obedience, which I haven't read. It's yeah, on my shelf. I, I have it on my <laughs> shelf, too. I don't, I don't know why I had read it, <laughs> right. but it's like part of me thinks it can't be as good as the Insanity of God, so I don't read it. Um, or, I don't know. <laughs> That's another issue. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that that one uh, I would rank 
pretty high. Um, Torture for Christ, uh, Richard mm-hmm. Wurmbrand, um, of, again, of um, communist Romania at the time. Um, Jim Elliott. Oh, yeah. You know, that, that one's not easy to read. I, I would say probably maybe Elizabeth Elliott's uh, book about it. Um, not the journal. <laughs> right. It took me the same amount of time to read it as it did for him to write it, <laughs> which is like his college years. It was my college years reading it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was um, stirring in that it was a young guy that I could connect with in some degree. You know, some of it I couldn't, but um, I think that was pretty powerful. And then to know what's happened since that time. Um, you know, And so when you hear these stories, it, it kind of encourages me in the present day. Yeah, you know, to know like when we heard the stories of communist China in times past, it just lets me know things are still happening, even with China um, shutting things down. Um, I'm like, you know, this has happened before, and God, God has always, you know, in that case, not only preserved a remnant but multiplied it, it. flourished, yeah, yeah it flourished in it all. Yeah. Um, so it just lets me know it, it's okay. When these things happen, mm-hmm. as Paul is telling us here, it's, it's going to happen, brother. You know, it it's coming your way. Right. And when when that happens, you're just entering in the same thing that happened in Jerusalem. And so it's a pattern that from the get go. Right. Uh, but these stories, it, and, and that's, you know, I wouldn't say it's a, a torturing or anything like that. But there's a guy in one of our groups, workout groups, um, that was just flat out honest with the with. Um, addictions and sins that he dealt with uh, with a group of men mm-hmm. um, and in it he and his wife then um, they, they were able to maintain their marriage through everything and was able to tell their stories but that in itself just being open and honest about their struggles um, in obedience um, but God's grace winning out in that openness was such a huge encouragement to uh, a large segment of men. Um, so I mean, so it doesn't have to be the story of, you know, someone's <laughs> threatening me because I'm a follower of Christ. Right. It could be just here's how I'm trying to follow Christ, and here's where I'm struggling with it. But here's what I'm learning from it. Um, sometimes that is just also as powerful because when you when you read these guys that go through all the hard stuff. That's part of it mm-hmm. that you read is like, oh man, they struggle um, with out and iron. You know, struggle with it. David Brandard struggled with this, and Jim Elliot. You read his struggles with it, and um, and common temptations that we deal with today. And it's like, oh, they're not some another class of Christian. Right. They are you and me. Right. Um, and I think that's where the power's at. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and it really comes back to that opening part of our vision statement of in Christ we are a family together um, that there's this call within that to act as a family to um, share with one another about what's going on within our lives um, and to share both the struggles but also how God is working through the struggles the victories as well yeah. um, and to utilize that as a, understand that our stories um, aren't they're not just for us but they're to be shared to encourage yeah. others in the faith that there's this, this calling upon us to to love one another through bearing one another's burdens through the hard time, um, through sharing how God's working, through encouraging one another, um, especially in the suffering, to point others to Christ, that all of this stuff is called for us to be a part of the church body. That's what it's to look like yeah. for us to be a family together. And so that's why it's it's always encouraging getting to watch. Um, you know, it's, it's always awful. You hate seeing somebody go through, whether it be like sickness or like cancer or different things like that. But it's awesome how God works through the faith of those people, mm-hmm. and it has an effect throughout our church. Yeah. Where the faith of somebody as they're dealing with cancer or familial issues or things like that can have this strengthening impact where it emboldens others within our church. Yeah. Um, it encourages others, but it also is a light to the world around us yeah. as well. And yeah. so um, that's where, like, you know, the Miss Fays and the Miss Barbaras and mm-hmm. and others who have gone before. Right. Um, I mean, you don't want to say this, but it's like, it helps to have someone show us how to die. Right. I mean, that's not like, no one's going to sign up for that class. Right. Nor is right. anyone teaching, you know, signing up to teach that class. But it's a class that has to be participated in. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in a church, 
if you don't shy away, um, you can get those lessons. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that is the powerful aspect of, and, and honestly, one of the great gifts of our church is the mixes of ages, um, where you get those stories of the different ages. And, you know, the, the, the 75 year old needs to hear the struggles of the 25 and 30 year old and what they're dealing with and vice versa, certainly. Um, and, you know, when we have our groups sharing stories and having that uh, proximity with one another and get them to rub shoulders, man, that, that's a powerful thing. And, mm -hmm. and, of course, it makes me plug the 365 Christian Men, <laughs> right. you know, that uh, podcast website. Um, they should, they should uh, be paying me money. <laughs> been endorsing it left and right. But right. It's, it's just, again, it goes along the same idea of, you know, Here's a guy. Here's what they did, and here's why they lived, and mm -hmm. here's a lesson from it. Right. So it's good stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we'd love to hear some of the other missionaries that um, you have found encouraging, or different um, stories you've read that have helped encourage your faith, point you to Christ. Um, where we always, I always enjoy reading about new people and studying that. That's why I love that. His, that Christian, it's 365 Christian men, which I think they're beyond 365 now because yeah. um, they've been doing it for more than a year, I think. But um, we'd love to hear have you share that with us as well. Uh, thank you for watching slash listening. Um, we hope you have a, a great week.